Hello, my scholars and saints. It is so cold in uh, January 11th, so um, sorry if this uh, video or episode is coming up uh, late in the day. I just took the morning to do some yoga, which I uh, sometimes am not super disciplined on. I think it's just hard to like take off my socks <laughs> to do yoga because you have to have bare feet and um and I was reading a little bit of uh, women who run with wolves that was my a new purchase recent purchase that I have and there's this amazing video as well on manufacturing intellect one of my favorite YouTube channels uh, it is titled Toni Morrison Interview on Woman Life Song with Clarissa Pinkola Estes and others from the year 2000. So it has Jesse Norman, um, who is a great sort of operatic singer, and Judith Weir, who uh, is a composer, and Toni Morrison needs no introduction. and. Um, it's just, I was watching that as well, had some breakfast, and saw on Instagram that my friend over at Psyche Podcast is reading Bianco Chohan's Non Things, and when I see that, I want to go back to the book and <laughs> try to remember it and, you know, have a conversation. So this is what we're going to look at today. I'm going to start out reading the back cover because I think it describes the book really well and then we'll just start with the preface and see how uh, far we get probably not very far as usual so just a reminder this is the close readings channel so I read mostly word for word and then pause with commentary because I think there are a lot of channels out there that summarize books and those are great and probably a lot more popular and interesting um, but I don't know that's just also not my thing so all right uh when was this book published it was published in 2021 in german and then 2022 in from polity press which i love the polity press books like if i ever work on the book that i started writing in the summer i will or I don't even remember when I started it. Earlier this semester, I think, um, I would love to be published by them because they have pretty covers. Okay, so I hope that you are all well. I hope that you are all warm. It's just very windy and it's starting to snow again. Okay, back cover. We no longer inhabit the earth and dwell under the sky. These are being replaced by Google Earth and the cloud. See, and just this very sentence is what makes me think that he waxes, Han waxes, um, to the pre-modern past, like the ancient past that, you know, had to encounter nature and live in nature with ritual, and he has a whole book on ritual, and, you know, probably even magic and druidry and like you know all of that kind of okay that sound if you can hear it is the snow scraper people um in their in their trucks you know the the pagan the indigenous world which i love cuz i also wax nostalgic for that time the terrestrial order is giving way to a digital order. The world of things is being replaced by a world of non-things, a constantly expanding infosphere of information and communication which displaces objects and obliterates any stillness and calmness in our lives. So it seems like he is longing for, or he is responding to a loss of a very specific kind of materiality. Um, we can think of... Uh, a divide between the material and the spiritual in one way. I think the most common way is materials of 
you know, consumerism and production versus maybe in some people's perspective, uh, including mine, uh, to some extent, uh, although I'm not really an either or, but a both and kind of person, um, maybe higher order, higher value, more abstract, um, transcendental, transformative, psychic, uh, spiritual issues and matters. But I think there's, um, so, so in that sense, I think Khan in that conversation would value the spiritual over anything that's materialistic. But there's this other kind of material versus not necessarily the, the opposite or, or the inverse of the former conversation, but specifically non-material would be a good word. And not the non-material would be like the virtual world, the information, um, technology, etc. And the material world would be, see in the first conversation, the material world was more like human-made things. And in this conversation, the material is something that we go toward, um, or Han is going toward, or we who agree with him are going toward, uh, with non-human-made material, like nature, like our bodies. Um, so... Byung-Chul Han's critique of the infosphere highlights the price we are paying for our growing preoccupation with information and communication. Today we search for more information without gaining any real knowledge. We communicate constantly without participating in a community. We save masses of data without keeping track of our memories. We accumulate friends and followers without encountering other people. This is how information develops a form of life that has no stability or duration. And as we become increasingly absorbed in the infosphere, we lose touch with the magic of things, which provide a stable environment for dwelling and giving con continuity to life. The infosphere may seem to grant us new freedoms, but it creates new forms of control too, and it cuts us off from the kind of freedom that is tied to acting in the world. I really love that. I think whoever wrote this, that cover, it's really beautiful. <laughs> Um, I paused because I was thinking about um, I think Twitter is such a good example of a space where there's a contradiction between desire and reality or what we long for and what is and can be and I wonder if it's just the issue of having such a limited space to, to post content. I mean, I don't remember what it is, 240 characters or something. And I post, I said in one of my shorts on YouTube that it, the, the energy of Twitter feels very snarky. And even myself, I can't quite figure out how I want to use that medium. or not necessarily how, I, I think I know that, like how I want to use it, but the way in which to manifest and express myself on it. Um, and we can think of Twitter as being, I mean, it does have knowledge, I think, and it does have, you can have connection on it, um, but it, it, it does seem as well like atomized information, especially when you just have all of these people however many hundreds of thousands or more maybe millions of people on probably millions right uh, on this app and we're all posting and uh, no one's really reading if anything people are skimming what everyone's posting and you would even think that some people who would because of who they are would have lots of likes, etc. I'm thinking one example is Steve Fuller. Um, he was someone that I, his book is Post-Truth is what I came across in one of my university classes that I took, the first one on postmodernism. And so he is, you know, a well-known living philosopher on Twitter. 
he should have more response, I think, to his tweets, but even, I, I see that even his postings like go without recognition. So there's not any connection or community that's happening. There's a lot of atomized, I guess, like shots of data that we're producing and in a kind of hazy way consuming. Okay, so let's go to the, oh, and this is translated by Daniel Stower. Probably said that wrong. Okay, preface. And there's some Japanese here that I'm going to mispronounce. In her novel, but now I want to read it, um, Hisoyaka na Kisho, the Japanese writer Yoko Agawa tells the story of a nameless island. Strange occurrences alarm its inhabitants. Things disappear without explanation, they disappear for good. Things that smell nice and shimmering, glittering, wondrous things. Hairbands, hats, perfume, small bells, emeralds, stamps, roses, and birds too. And the people no longer know what all these things were once for. Along with the things, memories disappear as well. Yoko Agawa's novel describes a totalitarian regime whose memory police, reminiscent of Orwell's thought police, purge society of things and memories. The people live in an eternal winter of forgetfulness and loss. Anyone found to be reminiscing is arrested. The protagonist's mother, who keeps threatened things in a secret chest of drawers and in this way protects them, is chased and killed by the memory police. There are strong analogies between Hisoyaka na Kisho, published in 1994, and our contemporary life. Today, things are also constantly disappearing, without us seeming to notice. Because the number of things has proliferated, we do not realize that, in fact, things are disappearing. I mean, I think maybe one example of this, and I actually, I guess, because of my generation, I'm kind of a good person to talk about this, because I straddle a more material, like, as in, if as he is talking about, as Han's talking about world, um, as well as, you know, like basically living the first half of my life in a more material world. And I just have Madonna like flash through my brain. Um, and uh, not that kind of material. And, uh, you know, this, uh, the latter half of my life, the present half of my life, second half of my life, as, you know, it is have lived uh, in an abstract world so one thing and you can probably see this on TikToks about like millennials um, photo albums so maybe people don't necessarily keep photo albums but they have a lot of pictures digitally like on their computer and their cloud or as Han was saying or someone was saying on the back cover um, or Instagram is our photo albums um, but people back in the day and I guess you know certain generations still do have actual books that you can take out off of the shelf and look through like we got our pictures developed and pasted on pages and then put stickers and things like that however people decorate their photo albums if they if it's like a scrapbook um another thing is you know books of cds you have a book of cds that and then i don't remember whatever happened to like the glass or plastic cases the clear plastic cases but I guess those are tossed um, or just stacked away <laughs> in junk drawer. We have these books of CDs, but now we have Spotify and we have it everything on our phone and our phone is not just music. It's lots of things because it's on the internet. So in a way, as Han was saying, it's more convenient. I mean, it's, it's so great. I don't know if I want to go back. But then is there something kind of beautiful in the materiality of something handheld? I guess the third example I could give is, you know, libraries of books versus a Kindle. A 
Okay, I have no idea where I stopped. <clears throat> um, it is rather our intoxication by communication and information that makes things disappear. Okay. Information that is non-things obscures things and drains them of their color. That's interesting. How does it obscure? What does it obscure? We live not under a violent regime, but under a rule of information that claims to be freedom. In Ogawa's dystopia, the world is gradually emptied out. Ultimately, it disappears. Everything is seized by disappearance, by a progressive dissolution. Even body parts disappear. In the end, there are just disembodied voices aimlessly floating in the air. This is interesting, and this is what I did post as a comment on Psyche Podcast's Instagram, was that it made me think of where we might be going as a species, looking at all that we can do with technology and our bodies and AI and just thinking about this show that I watch somewhat repeatedly on, I think, Amazon Prime uh, called Upload. It's about, I mean, there are people who are just, you know, living in their material bodies, but there's a virtual world where you can upload your consciousness to when you pass away. And, and I just wonder, well, if that's true, I mean, but anyone in that society could decide to transition from their bodily life to, you just have to scan yourself, to the virtual world where you're still you, you have your consciousness, but, you know, you have a virtual body. And I just wonder if we feel our bodies in the material world are problematic. And I think that we do just as evidence looking at what we've decided to move on from and evolve from. And those three examples are, you know, hold. Because it's more, we're more mobile, we're more free, it's more convenient. And just thinking about all that we consider problematic about our bodies or that we wish we could change like for instance uh, the aging like I mean I uh, am pro-aging and I am not saying that like changing the way you look isn't beautiful as you get older it is but the things that really none of us would want to celebrate such as sicknesses and illnesses and the difficulties that come along with aging so like non um like appearance things things that cause you know older people pain and discomfort and uh, and then even things like uh anxiety and depression and mental illnesses would we i mean we already take you know either medicines or supplements etc many of us do for these things would we rather be bodiless or have a chip in our brains that you know make that not a reality anymore and then if we go further and further and further where eventually we don't have bodies we're just actually living in a virtual world if i mean i'm not sure that's like scientifically possible if to upload your consciousness like that tv show uh presents but you know something we we have um like uh i don't know a synthetic body somehow what do we lose and i think han this book is about that this book is maybe trying to tell us like all of his books are to slow down to turn around to go back to be more cautious about progress um because if we take away all of the suffering that human beings go through in life what can we no longer experience 
you know, sometimes people say, if you don't like something about someone, be careful what you wish for and wanting them to change because it might change the things that you do love about them. You know, like if you have a friend that's like always late, you're like, oh, I wish this friend would just be on time. Well, a person who is on time is probably more careful and less carefree and more orderly and serious. And I don't know, I mean, I'm making vast generalizations, but just an example. Um, Whatever it is, X, Y, and Z, uh, the type of person who is on time also has other attributes and not maybe the other attributes that you think are lovable in that person. So it's like if you take away one thing, that's uncomfortable or dissatisfactory in our human predicament and bodily existence, what else are you taking away? Like, are you limiting, are we going to be limiting the range of our emotions that we can experience and tap into? Because if I don't necessarily suffer, if I don't need to cry because I'm releasing grief or you know, yeah, I'll just (laughs) stick with that. Um, If I no longer need to cry, then maybe one day I would regret that, you know? I would regret, if I could still have consciousness of regret, maybe you can't regret anything anymore because we've made life so perfect. But again, I mean, this is, you know, on the other hand, really, not again, but on the other hand, Uh, isn't that what we hope for in terms of spirituality and religious afterlife? Being in a place where we don't have to... uh, And maybe that's the thing. Maybe we can imagine a world where it's not a point of no return, but we can just more control when we enter into that space of certain emotions and feelings. I don't know. Just, you know, my thoughts. In many respects, the nameless island of lost things and memories resembles our present. Today's world is fading away and becoming information. Information as ghostly as those disembodied voices. Digitalization de-reifies and disembodies the world. It also abolishes memory. Instead of memory, we have vast quantities of data. So, I mean, I think maybe what he's saying by this, or maybe he isn't, but I think this is a good example anyway. Um just the example of phone numbers no one has to memorize phone numbers anymore because we have them all in our phone do we even sometimes i mean it's better if you memorize your own phone number but i can imagine some people not even knowing what their phone number is because it's just in your phone and you have a phone why do you need to know your own phone number um you know and there's a long tradition in ancient times of memorizing being a skill that everyone or many people had to have or desperately wanted and was highly valuable and now we don't maybe necessarily need to do that because we could just look something up um in the place of memory the memory police we have digital media which does its job without violence and with little effort Our information society is not quite as monotonous as Ogawa's dystopia. Information creates the illusion of a series of events. Information feeds off of our attraction toward surprise. But the attraction does not last long. Soon there is a need for a new surprise. So he's talking about how information has made, I guess, knowledge very superficial based on affective effects. We are now in the habit of perceiving reality in terms of attraction and surprise. As information hunters, we are becoming blind to still and conspicuous things, to what is common, the incidental and the customary, the things that do not attract us, but ground us in being. And I guess here, it's saying that we are less, maybe we're less perceptive. We... um, have, uh, I guess, what am I trying to say? 
less attention spans. And so, you know, in politics, wouldn't it be great if we had three hour conversations of sincere people valuing integrity and valuing truth over surprise and shock and sort of emotional kind of manipulative, um, I guess, expressions. But now it just seems as if political debates are entertainment and they just don't have substance or depth because people maybe don't have attention spans or they that it's kind of insulting to the mass masses us because maybe they think that if we have a nuanced conversation then we won't be able to choose a side perhaps i don't know so i think i'm going to stop there because uh, the next chapter we wouldn't be able to get into too much of it it's about 10 pages so maybe i'll pick this up next time thanks so much everyone for listening and watching drop your comments below